Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Is this working? Can you fix the volume? Good evening. Welcome to Edible Education 101. I'm Will Rosenzweig. We have a very exciting group of speakers tonight. Our topic is food, innovation, and entrepreneurship. And we've got six really outstanding entrepreneurs who are disrupting the food system in a variety of areas. I thought I would spend a few minutes tonight giving you a little bit of context about what's happening in this space, and you'll be happy to know that half of our speakers tonight are Berkeley alums, so... Did you fix me, Bob? Oh, thank you. Oh, the on-off switch. The old on-off switch. Um, a couple of things. Remember, this is a technology-free zone. Also. We're going to take attendance tonight uh, twice, just so you know, once at the beginning, once toward the end. If for some unforeseen reason you have to leave the room, please do it by the back door, not the front door, so you don't distract. Thank you very much for those of you that participated in the mid-course feedback. It was very valuable. Um, we reviewed it with the team. The, biggest single comment was both a positive and a request, and that was that we do more Q&A, and we will definitely try to do that. One of the challenges has been that because we live stream and videotape this, and we haven't had an, uh, a microphone out in the audience, it's been difficult to pull that off technically. So we're going to try to get better at that and have a place where if you have a live question you want to ask, you can come to the aisle and do it in a way that it'll be recorded and be part of the broadcast. Because we've been getting quite a few people um, involved in that. Do you have a question? Yeah, the recordings right now are posted on YouTube. And they're um, accessed through the Edible Education Project, the Edible Schoolyard Project website. It's, it's, they're not quite as easy to find as I'd like because they're part of the whole repository of classes of five years worth of this course. But we'll try to tag them a little bit to make it easier. Also, I think Ryan's going to be able to put them on our Facebook page. Just as a reminder, we now have an Edible Education at UC Berkeley Facebook page. So we'll be sure to link the videos from the classes there as we can. OK? And they're also on the Edible Schoolyard Facebook. OK? Um, there was a couple of other uh, suggestions. One, uh, we, uh, three people wanted more food. Um, one person insisted I throw t-shirts up into the audience at least once. Um, oh, three people said, where's Michael Pollan? Thanks very much. He's here next week. So uh, anyway, for the most part, they were quite um, helpful. And thank you for that. Here's your first eye clicker question of the evening. If you're ready. OK, everybody. Schmilk is a new non-dairy drink. A, are you ready, Rohini? It's already going. B, Soylent's newest product. Or C, the opposite of real food. Where do we here? Oh, I love this, how you always change your answers. <laughs> Isn't that great? C is the correct, correct answer. For those of you that did the reading, you'll know that this was a reference that uh, Steve Case made in his article about the future of food is food and not uh, synthetically contrived ingredients. And I thought that was sort of timely with our class here. Can you switch us back to? So how do we prevent that from happening where everybody switches back? We can't? We can't? I don't know. OK. So again, your papers were due tonight at 6 o'clock. Thank you very much for turning them in. I, and thank you for those of you that contacted one of the teaching team members for some input. We're really looking forward to reading your papers over the next couple weeks. Um, just so you can plan ahead at that very busy end of the semester, 
time the next paper is going to be due on April 26th, which is also a Wednesday at 6 p.m. if you want to make a note of that. I believe it also says that in the syllabus. Um, we will post a similar rubric. This next question for you just to think about is going to be about taking personal action and personal responsibility for something you care about in the food system that might have, you might have been illuminated for you in this, in this class. But there'll be more on that. Tonight is the Food Tech Innovation Showcase. As I mentioned, we've got six amazing speakers. I've seen five of them tonight. Is VJ here by any chance? Not yet. He'll come flying through that door shortly. If not, we'll have five. Um, I thought I'd just give you a little background of kind of what's enabling food tech entrepreneurship and innovation. And I think of it as sort of a perfect storm of ubiquitous technology. So we have mobile everywhere now, globally, and 24-7. We've got social connecting billions of people and becoming part of our daily routine, habitat, um, and attention. We've got cloud computing where we've got massive amounts of data being managed and aggregated and delivered on demand to these mobile devices. We've got now the beginning of sensors showing up everywhere. This is probably the starting to lead the edge. If you we're at the Consumer Electronics Show five years ago. You would have seen one or two booths focused on kind of the smart home. Now there was virtually a half a floor dedicated to um, that sector. So the you know, Moore's Law where computing power doubles and cost halves each year is happening real time in cloud and in the sensor community. And then probably further out, but we're just starting to see it, um, is automation, where automation is affordable, accessible, controllable, um, in a way where we're starting to see it come into food. We, I showed you that robot making a latte the other day. We've also now got a new restaurant in San Francisco called Itza. Anybody been to Itza? where the only human being is there to show people how to operate the computer interface. Apparently, behind that magic curtain of a wall are only machines and no humans preparing the, the bowls of quinoa and fresh vegetables. So digital is, is disrupting traditional food relationships at the direct-to-consumer level. So consumers are direct, you know, bypassing retailers, you know, going to Amazon Fresh, but now what's really interesting is Amazon just announced their first prototype retail store called Amazon Go in Seattle, which is gonna be about 800, 1,800 square feet. So a small footprint, you know, that's different than a 30,000 foot Whole Foods, but 1,800 square feet where you don't even check out. All of the uh, products you buy are equipped with sensor tags that just scan what you picked up and when you walk out your build. Um, of course, digital media, if VJ's able to get here tonight, you'll have an example of some of the latest in kind of video-enabled discovery um, with NOM. Um, consumers as players, consumers discover, share, make, and trade food recipes, food traditions, food ideas, and food products. They see themselves as co-creators. So Sophie Egan talked to us about chefing this idea that everybody is sort of in control of their destiny with food and digital media is enabling that um, quite a bit as well. And then there are disruptive food companies. You'll hear from several tonight, Impossible Foods creating an alternative to, um, to cattle raised uh, meat and, and more. So, you know, I thought just as to give you kind of an orientation, where is a lot of innovation happening? Probably the, the, the area that's had the most entrance and the most money has been in this food delivery space. Anybody used a company like Plated, Munchery, Blue Apron yet? Okay. Um, alternative proteins or meal or food substitutes. There's a lot of different names. Um, discovery, digital media, as I mentioned, sensing and big data, this internet of things. Sensors everywhere is kind of the internet of things and automation. This is an interesting map. I'll post these slides so you can take a closer look. This is something that Britta Rosenheim puts together for the investment sector, but 
These are all the companies in all the um, sub-segments that have come into food tech and media in the last couple of years. So it's a very dense um, area. The barriers to entry tend to be quite low. The companies that you're going to hear from tonight are building barriers to entry um, in very fascinating ways. And maybe some of the, um, the CEOs will mention in their presentations how they're doing that. But as you can see, this has become a very robust area. And this is a, a chart that just shows, really, for the last four or five years, the number of deals and the number of dollars that have been invested. 2015 was sort of the ultimate year. This chart ends in the middle of 2016, but 2016 fell short in investment dollars. There was something like $5.6 billion invested in food and tech in those six areas that I showed you um, in 2015. And I don't know exactly where 2016 ended up, but again, it was lower. Now the press is starting to talk about the great fall off. And again, the majority of those dollars went into this um, food delivery space, which I'll show you more. This is another slide that I like that kind of shows the spectrum of cooking to eating, where different companies are kind of playing and Depending on who's raising money, you'll notice that different companies will position themselves in the food tech area, like Yelp ends up on this chart. Um, Thrive Market down here. Um, Thrive Market. Anybody use Thrive Market? Sort of a Whole Foods for non-perishable products online. Um, they are doing very, very well. They're scaling really quickly. Blue Apron, of course, is sort of the lead horse in the um, food delivery space. It's interesting, the food delivery market has this creative tension. It's an incredibly complicated business in terms of logistics and margins. Um, but latest I read is that Blue Apron is pushing a billion dollars a year in revenues, um, which is pretty astounding for a company that started in 2012. So they have clearly identified a new niche for prepared meals or, or ready to cook meals at home. Um, this is a little harder read. Again, you'll be able to see this. But this is sort of a, a look at all of the companies that have come into the food delivery space um, in the last five, six years. And with some graphic detail about kind of who died who got bought, and who's still going. So you can see this. there was a real flood of people. You know, and, it, and it sort of came at that, um, that moment where mobile was everywhere, and people were really starting to transact habitually on mobile. So this is another chart that just shows kind of the a number of companies that have been founded, um, where the distribution of companies is. This is the number of companies founded. So in 2015, we had 254 new food tech companies. This is where they're kind of distributed. You'll see that a lot of companies are being founded in India, China. The US is number two here. So this food delivery in China is just off the charts, and India as well. Um, this is the year-over-year -year fundraising. Um, and this one says kind of restaurant, agri this is kind of where the money's going. A little hard to read. OK, here's a chart on the food replacement market. So we've got a lot of entrants in dairy-free milk and cheese. You've probably been reading the press now. There's a lot of talk about the dairy industry now. The Dairy Council and their lobby has come forward saying, hey, you can't call that milk unless it comes out of a cow. So you have almond milk, and you have these non-dairy milks. Ripples, the newest one, using pea protein. But they're getting into this um, systems problem that we've talked about, where the incumbents are pretty nervous about people you know, um, coming into their space. Um, we've got egg substitutes, uh, Hampton Creek, a local company. We've got um, meat substitutes. I don't know why. Um, impossible. Impossible is also over here. Insect protein, anybody eaten any grasshoppers lately? A couple of you. You can get exo 
cookies. Um, anyway, a lot of activity in that area. Um, this is a chart that shows kind of the ag uh, tech sector. And again, just looking at vertical farms, next gen farms, tracking um, animal data as we talked about, you know, antibiotic free animals, the way animals are raised. All of this data is becoming valuable to consumers and retailers, the whole supply chain. Uh, farm management software, and then of course precision agriculture and predictive analytics. You'll hear from our uh, speaker tonight from Consumer Physics about that. So with that intro, what I'm going to do is ask everybody to come up one at a time and spend about 10 minutes talking to you and keeping it tight so that everybody has a chance to go in the next hour. And then that'll give us plenty of time for um, some Q&A. Okay, from the audience. So first, I'm really proud to have Megan Mokri here. Megan just graduated last year with her MBA from the Executive MBA program. Uh, I was delighted to have her in the Food Venture Lab class. She's the founder of Bite Foods, and um, I'm gonna let Ryan kind of set up the uh, computer. What you could also do while you're here, you could either talk behind there or you could grab one of those mics, whatever you wanna do. Um, yeah, you can move around. One thing you might also do is tell um, people a little bit how you used your Berkeley Business School education to help accelerate the. Uh, I can do that success. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And being Please in a class Megan with this Mokri. guy, right? <clears throat> Thank you. Hey, what? First of all, it's so exciting to see a packed auditorium of people interested in food and bright minds that want to get in and make a change in the food system. So thank you for having me. My name is Megan Mokri. I'm the founder and CEO of Byte. And what Byte is doing is bringing the retail experience of food closer to the consumer using connected refrigerators. So food in the office is completely broken. Um, Today in offices, you either have to have a substantial budget to cater for your employees on an ongoing basis, or you have to be of the size to warrant having a cafeteria. But if you're any other office, you really don't have a good, affordable option to get fresh meals to your employees. And so you end up with this predicament of 99% of offices having no fresh food on site. And it's a, it's a massive market, $20 billion market. But have you guys ever been on campus when the cafeteria is closed? What do you do for food? You know, when Spoon Rock was around, you could order a meal. But without that, you have maybe vending, you have to walk somewhere, but there's not a readily available fresh food option. Same goes for hospitals. You could say the same for apartment buildings, gyms. And that's the fundamental problem that, that Byte is tackling. Um, let's see if this video is going to work. So the a Byte smart refrigerator, it's really easy to use from a consumer perspective. It looks like a fridge with a tablet. It's locked until you swipe your credit card, at which, at which point the fridge door opens. Um, it's like a normal retail experience. So you can actually pick up a salad, you can grab a blue bottle, look at the ingredients, and then only once you close the door are you automatically charged based on what you removed. And, and that's it from a consumer experience. Very easy to use. And so you end up with this tiny market in your workplace, just 20, 40 feet away from where you spend 40, 60, 80, 100 hours a week, in my case. Um, so you have instant gratification. The moment that hunger strikes, you can walk over and get breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, any of those in-between times. Um, we are very cognizant of where we source our food from. So uh, we like to say that everything in our fridge has clean ingredients. Uh, we'll work with everyone from a maker featured at a local farmer's market to uh, natural food brands that you know and love, like Harmless Coconut Water or Perfect Bars or whatnot. Um, and that allows us to sell a high volume of food to a dedicated audience um, that, that basically learns to trust Byte, and we become an option in that Rolodex of go-to options during the work week. The, as you peel back the layers of this onion, though, beyond the consumer experience, 
These are smart refrigerators, which means we get access to real-time data. And that data is what allows us to optimize our solution to that specific location, and more importantly, to, to you, you know, an ongoing customer who buys regularly from Byte. And there's really three areas of, of, of actual you know, social impact that we think about as a company. There's our customers. We are working with many locations that previously had to get in a car to actually get to real food. And now they have a 24-7 option. Our makers, the makers that we work with, this is an entirely new distribution channel for them and a direct way to actually get feedback from their customer base. Um, every, every receipt that goes out to our users gives people the ability to actually rate and provide feedback on the food. And oftentimes this is the first time that some of these makers are getting that feedback in real time. And then lastly, our community, because 100% of the food that goes in sold, we actually donate through a partner of ours called Extra Food, and that goes directly to nonprofits in need. So how does the business model work? Um, most locations will pay a subscription fee for the service, so $500 per month to get a fridge placed in the, in the office, completely turnkey, ongoing service, and rotation of great foods for their employees. And then, of course, we sell food, so we make margin on the food. And all of that churns off a tremendous amount of data that, like I said, allows us to optimize the assortment of, you know, location at the Chevron refinery may look very different than a fridge that's at McKinsey in downtown San Francisco, for instance. And given this, Byte truly is the most affordable, fresh meal solution for workplaces. And that's what has allowed us to amass clients across really every industry. So we work with everyone from nonprofits like the San Francisco SPCA to your classic tech companies like uh, Cisco or Amazon, um, Tesla. We also work with healthcare. So we're in hospitals as well as schools. And it's this data that in real time we're seeing customer transactions, we're seeing the inventory across every one of our kiosks and market down to the level of knowing how long that sandwich has sat in that fridge at Sephora, for instance. Uh, and that data folds into uh, our operations. It also folds into adding more value to consumers. So if we know that you buy this chicken Caesar salad from Rustic Bakery every week and it's Friday and we've got one that's just sitting there and it's not selling, we can send a targeted offer to that consumer and say, you know, here's, here's $2 off your favorite salad. Take it home for the weekend and enjoy. So the, I've, I've talked about the custom assortment. The data feeds into making no two fridges in market alike. Um, pricing's dynamic, and this is really powerful for us. We sell fresh product. Fresh product, as soon as you buy it, and it arrives at our distribution center, it's got a clock that's ticking until that product is no longer fresh and can be sold. And so dynamic pricing allows us to um, leverage features like happy hours, where all fresh product in a fridge, for instance, is 25% off during a finite period of time. It allows us to balance sales with that, um, that fresh product and avoiding spoilage. It also allows us to offer our clients highly flexible subsidies. And what that means in practical terms is a company wants to support employees that are working late. Well, we can actually dynamically adjust prices so they're allowed to subsidize by 50% or 100% for employees that are there at like 8 o'clock at night or maybe they're early in the morning. Um, or they can do, you know, day-specific uh, sub subsidies as well. It basically works with any type of budget. Um, talked about, we, we have about um, our, our customers' emails paired with their full transaction history allows us to deliver highly targeted, highly relevant, you know, offers that they actually want to open up and use. And then lastly, we have delivery efficiencies in a number of ways. Um, these are deliveries that are getting pushed out to restock fridges. Oftentimes it's after hours because it's workplaces. So. I can tell you where our delivery fleet is going next week and the week after. It's highly predictable. That real-time inventory also allows us to push out with the precise uh, kit of food products that that location needs. And that is it. Looking forward to all your guys' uh, questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, you can sit. That's great.
Okay, uh, next up, Brian, can you work the slides? Sweet cream? Oh, okay, so can you just take that one down? Okay. Um, hi, VJ. Glad to see you. Uh, next up, uh, delighted to have a return guest to Edible Education, one of the co-founders and co-CEOs of Sweetgreen, uh, one of the remarkably fast-growing, fresh salad and good food places, and probably the one that went kind of digital and cashless first. And so I asked Nick this year to talk about what it's like to design a restaurant for a, a mobile savvy and a mobile facing uh, customer base. So please welcome Nick Jamet. Hi guys. Uh, before I start, I want to give a shout out to the sweet green salad in the back row right there. Saw that before. Um, so sweet green started 10 years ago in my undergraduate year at Georgetown, my senior year. Um, and it started um, really simply to solve a problem. Myself and my two best friends, John and Nate, had this issue of having nowhere to eat every day. And we simply wanted to solve that problem for ourselves. And um, it started, the solution to this problem started as Sweetgreen in a 560 square foot restaurant on M Street in Georgetown in a former little burger shack. So similar actually to what we did here, um, it was in a landmark burger shack that was there for 50 years. So I guess we have a thing for old burger shacks who've done that a few times. But for us, when we started, it was really just for ourselves. And as we really started to scale and dig in and learn more about food, we realized this wasn't just a problem for us. This was a problem for the whole community, for the whole city of DC. And quickly we realized this was the greater food system. Um, and so we knew that from that moment really early on that we were trying to build a different type of company. And it wasn't, we didn't want to just build another fast food chain company. We wanted to build a different type of food company that could solve this problem of connecting people to real food and creating access to real food um, in a different kind of way. So for us, when we started, we, we looked at the typical restaurant economic model and we kind of questioned all of it. Everything from what we served to where we bought the food to what the restaurant looked like to what the transaction with the customer was like. And little by little, we started to question every single part of the typical restaurant fast food model, um, which can be highly profitable. And so we're making these tweaks to this model that many massive companies have proven works, and uh, we're trying to figure this out as we go. So little by little, we realized that as we started building this company, many parts of it weren't going to work if we wanted to build um, a different type of food company. Everything from our supply chain, building a different type of supply chain in every city that we go to, how to source that kind of um, incredible ingredients and have that connection to the farmer, doing full scratch cooking in a fast food setting, which doesn't happen today in any scaled, uh, scaled restaurant business. Um, everything from not serving soda to the not accepting cash, like Will said, these things are all parts of a typical economic model in fast food. Um, that generally are there because they work and because it's how you make a profit. But we knew that for us, we wanted to build a different type of company and, and to do that, we had to really spend time and build a company that could understand the customer and not where the customer is or where they were, but really where they're going. And we laugh a lot at Sweetgreen because when we think of innovation and, and how our businesses, we've tried to change you know, this model and, and innovate, a lot of it is forward looking, but a lot of it also is thinking about bringing this relationship with food back to the way it used to be. You know, people used to have to eat the things grown around them 80 years ago, 100 years ago. And for us, so much of it is redefining people's relationship with food and combining that with using technology to optimize the transaction and build a different type of experience. So for us, you know, we've tested many things in the business and as we've grown, we realized that um, we really had to think about this transaction. And typically food retail, you know, if you look at all the massive restaurant companies that have grown, they, you know, they build box after box after box, and you end up with a couple hundred or a couple thousand or tens of thousands of restaurants that more or less look the same, where the food tastes the same in every city, um, and it's highly standardized. And for us, the model is incredibly localized. 
So building a restaurant where the food and the menu is based on the supply chain in every single city. And <laughs> cute dog. <laughs> so for us, as we started to build this restaurant, it was really important for us to think about that transaction and the customer and how using technology to change this transaction uh, and really alter the typical retail and restaurant relationship between the guest and the team member. Um, so building this digital interaction has been a huge part of driving our business. And about four years ago, we really started to invest um, in our tech team and in our digital experience and building you know, what is now a Sweetgreen app that is pretty robust and drives over 35% of our transactions last year. And this year, we expect it to be between 40 and 45%. And the reason that's such a big deal for food retail is because this is really the first time any food retailer has been able to have this much of a connection with their customer, really have that customer data and get to understand how their customer's behaving, their frequency, what they're getting, which stores they're going to. All this customer data that allows us to build a better experience and have a deeper engagement with the customer. And so generally, as we think about leveraging technology in the retail model, I mean, we heard about companies like Itza, you know, the restaurant model is changing so quickly because things like the labor model is, you know, labor landscape is changing, cost of labor is going up, cost of food is going up. And the way we are battling that is trying to think about how we can use technology to optimize the experience. And at Sweetgreen, we believe that technology shouldn't fully replace humans. We think food is a, is a social human element and keeping that intimacy with the experience for us is very important. So as we think about leveraging technology, we've thought about it more to optimize people's jobs at Sweetgreen, how to make things way more efficient, how to make the productivity of the restaurant way higher, um, you know, how to make someone not remove the menial tasks from their day to day so that they can focus on coaching or interacting with customers. And that's really been the focus for us. And one of the big changes we made last year was actually removing cash from our restaurants. And it sounds like a simple thing, but the effect on the model is actually incredibly um, impactful and creates a lot of efficiency. Um, cash itself was down to about 10% of our transactions. When you remove cash from the restaurant, it does a bunch of things. A, it, it converts a lot more people to this digital app, and again, we have this, um, the beauty of having this relationship with them on the app and really having that data, but it creates a lot of efficiencies in the store model. And so for us, we knew that that was one of the biggest problems we wanted to solve. If we wanted to be able to pay our team members um, what we wanted to pay them, pay our farmers what we wanted to pay them, um, and really keep our prices accessible, things like that have to be optimized. And for us to you know, have someone in the restaurant that's getting paid $15 an hour counting nickels for a couple hours a day every time the register has changed seemed inefficient. And so that's just one of the ways that cash has actually optimized the business. But so, really as we think about the problems we're trying to solve in the model and how we use technology to leverage those, convenience is one of the biggest factors. And generally when you look at a food retail model or any business that is doing well in the restaurant space, there's peak times where capacity is hit and you have lines out the door and you can't serve as many customers. So what the mobile app has done for us, it's really allowed us to double or triple or sometimes even more than that our capacity at peak times. And it allows our customers to open their app and with two clicks order their meal that is either saved or is a new, or is a new order, and they can just walk into Sweetgreen and grab it off the shelf. Um, I feel funny talking about this here because our Berkeley restaurant is actually the only one in the whole country that doesn't have online ordering because it's so small. But if you go to another Sweetgreen, <laughs> you'll get it. Um, and actually, that's a good example of how much our business has changed just in the past two years. Two years ago, our digital penetration was about 5%. And this year, we think, like I said, it'll be over 40%. So when we were building Berkeley two years ago, you know, our business has evolved since then. And so it's actually pretty fascinating. But so for us, seeing how we can use technology and use the app to build a different type of experience that drives convenience and frequency. And so now someone that, that used to say, you know, I can't get this kind of food because it's sweet green is too busy or, you know, I can't wait in line, uh, now can just walk in and grab it. And we've seen our frequency of our customer um, improve dramatically. So convenience is a big problem. And the other thing I'll say is that, you know, one of the last things I'll leave you guys with is, if you think about over the past 10 years, one of the biggest problems we see ourselves as trying to solve is this, this perception of healthy food and people's relationship of healthy food. And generally 10 years ago when we started Sweetgreen, healthy food was either hard to find, didn't taste good, 
too expensive, and really just not accessible. And generally, it wasn't, there weren't any cool brands supporting healthy food. But you look at all the best brands out there, the ones that were the most accessible, the most delicious, the food that people had the most loyalty to, and it was all the least healthy brands. And we wanted to build the kind of company that could build a brand that celebrated healthy food just like you know, the big food companies of the world did. To use the power of marketing, use the power of engagement to really tell stories around real food and make that the cool thing. And so for us, we've done that through tons of ways, whether it's music and, you know, we actually throw one of the biggest music festivals on the East Coast called the Sweet Life Festival. And that started as a way of just us trying to connect with our consumers. And fast forward a couple of years, it turned into 25,000 people, you know, enjoying healthy food at a festival, listening to The Weeknd and Lana Del Rey and a bunch of other people, Kendrick Lamar. But so, again, this idea that we want to build the kind of brand that can celebrate healthy food and change the perception. It's this larger generational gap, this generational, generational shift that needs to happen. And actually something that happened on our opening day at Berkeley really I think does a good job of explaining this. And um, it was one of our newest employees at Berkeley. It was her first day on the job, we were training. And I introduced myself to her and it turns out she was 16 years old. This was her first job and she was really excited. And so I go outside, sit on the patio, and I, re and I sat next to this woman who I ended up striking up a conversation with, and it turns out that the woman was the girl's mother. And she told me that, you know, my daughter is so excited, this is her first job. She decided to become a vegetarian six years ago when she was 10. The whole family then went vegetarian. And she begged me to come work here. She found this on Craigslist. She said, Mom, I'm ready for a job. I want to work at Sweetgreen. You know, this is really cool. And so it was her first job. And the funny part was when the mom continued to tell her story of, you know, she had worked in food her whole life, and she said, you know, the funny thing is 20 years ago, my first job was at McDonald's, and I, I was really excited for that. So I think, you know, that for me was this moment where I realized that if we, along with a bunch of other companies, can create excitement and engagement and brands that can celebrate healthy food, we can create this change in mindset around people's relationship with food. And to see a 16-year-old girl get so excited about working in a healthy fast food restaurant, for us is really what it's all about. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Rebecca, are you ready? Rebecca Moses is the Director of Sustainability from Impossible Foods, another one of our great Bay Area innovators, really working on Meat, or not meat, meat without meat. And um, Rebecca is very involved with this interface between the product and the impact that it could create and will create in the world. And also the, um, well, you can tell the story, but the company, I mean, one thing for me that's interesting is this is a company that was started by a biochemist. Mm -hmm rather famous biochemist. So I always think it's interesting to kind of track the founding story of a company and what that initial motivation was around the problem that was to be solved. So I will hand you that. All right, thank you very much. Please welcome Rebecca Moses. Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, so my name's Rebecca. I lead sustainability and agriculture at Impossible Foods. We're a, we're a food tech startup down in Redwood City. We're about six years old now. Uh, for the past year, we've been launching in different restaurants. Um, and what we do is we make uh, meat and dairy products out of plants. We don't do this because it's easy. It's actually really, really difficult to do this. Um, but we do it because there's a large environmental crisis associated with animal agriculture. So all the inputs that go into uh, generating animal agriculture and bringing that to your plate uses a lot of land, water, generates a lot of emissions. It's a problem that uh, our founder wanted to solve. And so I'll just introduce the flagship product really quickly. This is the uncooked version. Uh, it looks like ground beef, but it's made from plants. Um, it's not schmilk. Everything in here started in a, in a farmer's field at some point. So we've got potato protein, uh, coconut oil that forms the fat of the burger. Um, wheat, that's texturized vegetable protein, wheat TVP. That's what forms kind of the musculature of the burger. And when we're thinking about products at Impossible Foods, when we're thinking about how we want to approach things, we want to make sure that it's meeting three goals. It has to be delicious, it has to be sustainable, and by proxy of being sustainable, it also has to be scalable. 
So I think the best way for me to actually introduce uh, why the company was founded was is to uh, go to a short cartoon from our CEO and founder, Dr. Pat Brown. He wanted to be here today. He couldn't because we're launching uh, in New York with Bear Burger uh, tomorrow. So everyone's over on the East Coast right now. But um, just a little background on Pat. He actually had his own lab at Stanford. We won't hold that against him. We, uh, he... Um, is a biochemist, and he decided that with the rest of his working career, he wanted to tackle the biggest problem as he saw it, and that problem is the huge environmental impact, environmental impact of animal ag. So I will cut to the cartoon. I grew up eating burgers probably once a week. On Sunday, my family would go out, buy a bunch of burgers, bring them home, and watch a movie on TV. It's such a canonical food the flavor and aroma and texture and the juiciness and, you know, all of that. But there's this huge dilemma that's posed by the fact that the way that we're producing meat is using a land area bigger than North America, South America, Australia, and Europe combined. The cows living on Earth outweigh every living wild mammal by a factor of 10. Animal farming is using an amount of water that could fill San Francisco Bay every day. So how in the world are we going to do this? There's actually an incredibly simple solution. Give people all the meat that they want, but just produce it from completely non-animal sources. What we had to do was some really, really deep fundamental science to understand, just in molecular terms, all the features of a burger. When you have the experience of the aroma and the flavor of beef in your head, it's just, this can only be one thing, the delicious fresh cooked burger. But if you take those molecules, separate them out one by one and smell them, zero of them smell like meat. They smell like caramel and butter, burning match, lilacs, pineapple martini was one of them. You know, there's no meat molecule. The magic of meat is just this combination of ingredients that can be found from completely non-animal sources. Potatoes, wheat, coconuts, a little bit from soybeans. We pull out very specific components from each of those sources in just the right proportions and get something that looks, tastes, and cooks like ground beef. The thing that I call the magic ingredient for the flavor is heme. It's the molecule that carries oxygen, makes blood red. Yeast, actually what's been used for many hundreds of years to make certain Belgian beers, makes heme very well. You get this potent aroma of beef. What we're producing is meat, the delicious flavor and the nutrition, and we've just figured out a way to produce it that doesn't have all the environmental destructive impact. I mean, I'm envisioning people having the same great experience with family and friends. There's the aroma and the sizzle, but I can also imagine the kids saying, Wow, you actually used to make these things out of animals. How wild is that? I don't think I've seen that bird in the Bay Area, but... Um, so when we, uh, so like I said, the, the way that technology is used in Impossible Foods, I mean, we're, we're fundamentally, we're a com company where technology is fundamental to what we do, but in particular, we use it for two major levers, and that's regarding efficiency, and it's regarding functional equivalency. And I'll return to both of these, but basically what we're doing is creating a market approach to drive demand side changes in dietary resource reduction surrounding meat and dairy. So the reason that we founded this company, and I think you know, Pat you know, stated this so well, is that right now we've, we've basically kind of run out of the biophysical option space for expanding animal production. That's gonna create a problem because right now, with seven billion people on the planet eating the amount of meat and dairy that we do, we use 30% of the ice-free surface of the planet that's directly occupied by animal ag in some way. 50% of the ice-free surface of the planet, about 50%, is uh, grazed by domesticated animals, uses about a quarter of the world's fresh water, and creates the same level of emissions as the entire transportation industry. So it's a huge mitigation target. And by proxy, the fact that it uses just so much land, it's also one of the primary drivers of deforestation and wild habitat loss. These aren't great things, but if you account for the fact that the UN 
Food and Agriculture Organization, has projected a 70% uh, increase in meat and dairy products by 2050. We're going to have about 9 billion, 10 billion people on the planet. Where does that expansion happen? Some of it's going to be through intensification, obviously. But what would be a lot more efficient and free up a lot more resources is to just eat lower on the food chain. And so this is where our efficiency comes in. Um, these are numbers that are based on a life cycle assessment. We're comparing ourselves to a conventional US beef burger. Uh, and the key to understanding why we can be so efficient in creating a ground beef product out of plants is understanding why beef are actually kind of bad at converting plant material into something that you can eat. So they're the single most inefficient uh, converter of plant protein and calories to a human plate. By the time a piece of beef has gotten to your plate, it's lost 97% of the calories and protein that went into the plants that produced it. So beef is by far among the animal products uh, the least efficient at that. So efficiency is one thing, um, scalability is one thing, but the really key thing here for us is that we have to make this something that's also delicious. So if you go to a barbecue, you know, you got there, you know, you care about resource use, you care about your footprint, you maybe you, you walked there, you biked there, you drove a Tesla, I don't know what you did, but you got there and you care about the environment. But if someone hands you a plate and says, hey, do you want this burger or do you want this slice of tofu or a veggie burger? you're probably not gonna choose the veggie burger unless you're already a vegetarian or a vegan. Um, and that's just because this is very abstract, this idea of deforestation somewhere in Brazil. It's, it's abstract. And so what we wanna do is create this product, and we have created this product, that is a functional equivalent to beef. So it's something that can be, um, you know, it's craveable in the same way that beef is. And a big key to that was the other component of our technology platform, which is heme. So heme uh, was mentioned a little bit in the video, but it's basically our version of plant blood. Um, heme is that molecule that you see there, that iron-carrying molecule, small molecule, and it is the basis for um, myoglobin. So the, the oxygen, uh, the, the compound that stores and moves oxygen in your blood and in mammalian blood cells is myoglobin. There's an analog for that in the plant kingdom, like hemoglobin. And so that was found by uh, its in the root nodules of leguminous plants, so soybeans, fava beans, you could harvest that agronomically, um, but that would mean ripping up the plant at exactly the right time of year, at exactly the right stage of maturity, and probably disrupting the soil structure while you're doing it. Scaling that up would be really impossible, but this thing, like hemoglobin, that blood isolate, which you can see in this bottle here, is really key to making beef, making plant-based beef taste like cow-based beef. It's what gives it that irony flavor, it's what makes it um, turn from pink or red to brown as you're cooking it through the Maillard reaction. It's a really key component that veggie burgers don't have, and so that was something that we needed to figure out how to get into a burger. So our scientists, about five years ago, said, okay, we're gonna express this in E. coli. And so they got E. coli cultures to crank out like hemoglobin. No one wants to market like hemoglobin in a you know, product coming from an E. coli strain. So what we decided instead to do was uh, manifest it through a yeast strain. So very similar to what you would see with, say, a you know, Belgian beer, uh, except it's genetically modified. The scientists found a way to insert the leg hemoglobin gene, cranked up expression of that gene, and so now it just cranks out heme. They're big, bright red fermentation vats. They're actually really pretty looking. Uh, but then we isolate that and incorporate it into the burger. So the thing that we always come back to in the company and that me, you know, being in charge of sustainability in ag, what I always think about is, um, you know, the technology is really innovative, it's neat, there's potentially a new value chain here, but we really want to focus on the mission. And that environmental mission, you know, we're a small part in this, there are so many ways to reduce resource use. But something that I thought was pretty timely was, I don't know if anyone read the New York Times last weekend, um, but Amazonian deforestation is kind of raging back. It had this abatement period for a long time, but new agricultural land uh, is expanding in the global tropics in forested areas. That's not great. Um, most of it's going into soy and pasture with some logging as well. If we were to find a way to eat plant-based diets without compromising what kind of food we ate, because you know we want to eat meat, we want to eat dairy, we want burgers at a barbecue, um, there's just a tremendous amount of additional headroom for innovation in agriculture, for um, possibly de-intensifying uh, de the existing agricultural land, and for sparing land for ecosystem services, biodiversity,
these important things that, you know, it seems like, especially in the past year, we've kind of been noticing the policy mechanisms for safeguarding biodiversity, um, you know, forests, climate change, those mechanisms are not necessarily as durable as we want them to be. So a market-based shift might be uh, one way of helping mitigate that. And we're choosing to do that in our own small way uh, through plant-based uh, meat and dairy products that are you know, a fraction of the resource use. Fantastic. Thank you. So Thank much. you. Let's see, VJ, you want to come up? Um, our next guest is VJ Karunamurthy. Uh, VJ is one of the co founders of NOM, which is a food and digital media company. And VJ uh, is another one of our uh, hallowed graduates of Haas. Always like having him back. Let's have a warm welcome for VJ. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you. It's always good to be back. Uh, like uh, William said, I am a Haas graduate. Um, 2012, I started off uh, evening weekend at 2009, um, kind of at the height of the financial crisis, if you can remember way back that far. So um, the economy was tanking. I came in really just interested in learning a little bit about this term I'd heard, which is social entrepreneurship. Um, it was a term that I knew very little about coming in. I felt like I knew more about it coming out. and. Um, hopefully everything we talk about today and with the panelists there too, it lives up to those values of what I learned um, during my time here. Um, so, so just to start off, you know, we are a food startup, but we come from the tech and media background. Um, both me and my co-founder started off from a very different place than probably a lot of entrepreneurs, um, but that's also like a great way of thinking about entrepreneurship and the, the, the range of ways where you could start something off and the ways you can explore an idea and see that to fruition. Um, so both me and my co-founder come from um, the media world. Uh, Steve started YouTube, which is a media startup, a tech startup, um, and is now like the largest video startup in the world. Um, I also worked at uh, YouTube for, for many years. Um, so after YouTube, you know, we were thinking about what was, and, and, it, and it's actually kind of interesting to start from a place where you've built something that's had like more success than anyone could ever dream of for a startup and what you wanna do for the next phase of your life. So for both me and Steve, um, we had the opportunity to think through ideas and think through what we saw the, the, the world had and what the world didn't have around things that were interesting to us. Um, and, and honestly, one of those, and I'll, I'll be very blunt about this and Steve would also be very blunt, there are lots of things about YouTube that never lived up to what you could have gotten out of that as, as, as something that you'd use every day. So YouTube does a great job of helping people discover content and watch content and hopefully you know, start a conversation around content. But YouTube has never felt like a community in the sense of a place where you were finding people and connecting with people and really understanding what those people loved and care about and what they were doing in real life um, in the way that it could have. And, and that started our whole discussion around what we wanted to do um, with the rest of, of our lives and what we wanted to do as a startup. Um, so just to start off, we thought about what we were really passionate about and things we were passionate about in real life. And food is honestly like a core part of many of our lives, but it's often something we undervalue and we only really appreciate when we're thinking about it. So a lot of people spend all day thinking about what you want to cook for dinner or where you want to go for dinner that night or really what inspires you around food. And, and that might be a core part of like how you, you interact with your friends, how you interact with your family. Um, and, and also the other part of that is food has become an aspect of people's careers and the discipline, the drive it takes to see your careers forward that you can see through chefs. And this is an example of, of an incredible superstar chef. This is um, Tim Hollingworth who opened Odium down in LA. Um, he started off at the French Laundry as a dishwasher um, just in, in the back scenes, you know, getting a start in the industry and over years kind of built himself up and got himself up to being um, one of the top chefs in the world. Um, and since Odom has opened that, you know, I think the reviews you'll see out of that are, are pretty incredible, but it, it's pretty clear it's a labor of love for him and it's something he's put a lot of thought and dedication into. Um, we started working with chefs like Tim to think through what we wanted to build out of our next site and our next app. And it was really a process of learning about what makes them tick and what drives them forward and how they think about how they tell their stories and express that to the world around them. 
Um, so I'm going to show you a bit of a video, and I'll, I'll just talk over it. Um, this is Corey Lee at Benu in San Francisco. Um, Corey's also a French Laundry alumni. Um, he has now opened a couple of restaurants in San Francisco and is kind of you know, internationally known. Um, but this is a video we shot even just in the user testing phase of what we were building, where we wanted to document what was happening behind the scenes in this kitchen. How do diners experience this, this like kind of crafted story that you're telling when you're sitting down at a fine restaurant. And also, how did people share that with each other? So you can go on Instagram today and you see a million photos about food that your friend is sharing. But what are people really trying to, to say and express when they share something about food with other people? And what are ways where you can make that better? Um, so we start off now around this idea and this vision. And, and to kind of come to like more recent times, um, we launched our app last year. Um, we were featured by Apple as a new apps we love on the App Store um, and Thanksgiving. Um, it's been an eye-opening experience for us. I, I think we will also be honest that when we start off this beta testing, we did a lot of restaurants that are well known in San Francisco, New York, and LA. Um, and being featured by Apple across the country means you get a lot of users from other parts of the country, from you know, Kansas and Missouri. And you have to have content that really connects and resonates with people um, all across the USA and not just in, in the big cities on the coast. Um, so it, it's been a great learning experience for us. Um, some of the press, you know, just to start off, kind of highlighted how we were thinking about food, how we are thinking about photo and video, um, how we are creating a new way for people to express themselves around passions that they had and things they were doing in real life. Um, and that's, that's, honestly, that's the best part of our telling our story as a company is people understanding that we wanted to do something um, a, a little bit different than the sort of content you see at YouTube and finding different ways of sharing that. Um, so this is also some of the press that we did around that. Um, I'm going to show a little bit with you of the app and um, some of the best examples of the content we have. Oh, actually, I'll, I'll show a little bit of that. So some of our investors are also people <laughs> that you maybe know. Uh, on the left is Corey Lee, but then there's Jared Leto, um, Sai from the Gungam Style Videos an Investor. It's always good to have like kind of crazy, far out there people um, pushing you to your limits of what you want to think about for a product when you're working on it. Um, so. This is an example of, of what we've built into the app that we launched. And when you come from the tech world, there are a few key things that you, you really have to believe in when you're building an app and you're building a user experience. And, and they've been really important to us. Um, one is, and Google Ventures is a very strong proponent of this, the, the sprint methodology of thinking through the core parts of the experience, um, being able to express user stories, doing that on a whiteboard or with post-it notes before you ever get down to writing a single line of code or sketching out an interface in Photoshop or whatever tool you use. Um, you really should be able to understand users, understand the story and the journey of what they express, um, and you should be able to capture that. And we start from the place of, you know, let's say someone um, has a love of coffee, they understand what goes into making um, an amazing latte, and, and they're at a site class. How would they really express that experience in a way that other people could get passionate about it? Um, we realized immersiveness was a really key piece of that. Um, you know, being able to feel like you're transported to another place when someone's actually there is an important part of live video and what makes live video connect with people. Um, and we also knew that community was, was a big, big piece of that too. So um, it's one thing to watch one person share something with you. It's another thing entirely to feel like there's a small group of people, even like eight or 10 other people that are sharing an experience with you. They're contributing their own you know, expertise and also just their own passion and joy for this topic. Um, and building that into an app is really important. Um, we knew for food, visual discovery was really, really important. So um, it's, it's understates tech, but something we learned at YouTube very early on. People at YouTube, when they come to the search bar, they often can't tell you what they're searching for. Um, there are some times where people search for Justin Bieber, and you know they're interested in Justin Bieber video. There are lots of times where they really just want to be entertained and they want to enjoy themselves. And so you know, food has a lot of aspects of that, where people aren't going to come in and tell you what sort of food do you love. You're not going to say, I love coffee as your first query. You're probably going to have a hard time expressing what your unique tastes and passions are. Um, and so we tried to find a place where visual discovery is a key part of that. And we can learn pretty early on, like in the example of this user, this user actually knows quite a lot about coffee. They maybe even know the difference between Blue Bottle and Sight Class as a coffee place in the city, um, and really just help people discover content that way. Um, we tried to really cover also what makes places really unique and interesting. So if you think about a neighborhood like the Mission District in San Francisco, it feels very different than um, you know, other neighborhoods in San Francisco. It feels very different than a neighborhood in LA. And so being able to show the restaurants and the tastemakers that um, encapsulate an area near you or an area that you're traveling to was an important part for us. 
Um, the, the last point I'll, I'll end on too is, you know, one thing that's really unique about food is this concept of authenticity. Um, we've had this idea that we're working with chefs, we're working with people who really understand their craft. Authenticity cuts many different ways. So, you know, I think when you're talking about um, someone who's run a taqueria in the Mission District for 15, 20 years, they understand what makes that that community experience of this taqueria really tick in a way that even a Michelin star restaurant couldn't tell you. And I think more and more people are looking for online experiences to have some layer of authenticity to them. It's one thing for Condé Nast as a corporation or the Food Network as a corporation to filter through and tell you about stories and experiences. And there are limits to how you feel like you can understand the world through there. Um, I hope one of our goals, you know, building tech startups and helping people express themselves is you can hear from authentic voices and authentic experiences um, a view of really what makes people's lives and how they got involved in these, these hobbies and passions that they share. Um, and so ho hopefully everything we're doing, you know, as the last year has demonstrated and you've seen live video really take off, you've seen people express themselves in a new way, it's pushing us all as, as a community down this route of having more authentic voices and authentic experiences expressed. Um, great. So Thank you. That's a little bit on that. Thank you. Thanks very much. So now we'll go from discovery through digital and social media to the world of um, really thinking about transparency, one of the themes of the course. Um, our next speaker is an entrepreneur from Israel who I met a number of years ago. He walked into my office with a big idea that he could scan any piece of food and tell me exactly what it was, what the nu nutritive content was. And, uh, and actually recognize it. And he, he kind of showed me a napkin originally, and I said, well, why don't you come back when you've got something that works? And lo and behold, um, here it is today. So, Dror Sharon from Consumer Physics. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Will. So, we're going to start off with a uh, video and uh, take it from there. Hopefully, you'll also hear the um, sound. So, one second, let's see if this works. Should work? The technology at our fingertips can help us do amazing things. It can help us navigate the world, know which restaurant to book tonight, or know what song is playing on the radio. But when it comes to the actual stuff around us, if you're not sure or just don't know, well, you're on your own. SIO is the first molecular sensor that fits in the palm of your hand. It scans the molecular fingerprint of an object and provides relevant instant information about its chemical makeup. You can use it to log the chemical fingerprint record it and share it with your friends. Imagine if there was a way to know which watermelon is sweeter. When is that avocado going to ripen? How many calories, carbs, or proteins are in that shake? How your plants are doing? What's in those pills you were taking? Imagine if there was a way to know the chemical makeup of everything you come in contact with. The applications are endless. SIO uses a tiny optical sensor called a spectrometer, which absorbs light reflected back from an object and breaks it down into a spectrum. The spectrum is then sent to our cloud for analysis, and our algorithm sends back the result to your phone in real time. Spectrometers are used today in labs around the world, but they are too large and expensive for everyday use. SIO is a tiny spectrometer that can be mass-produced at low cost. What's exciting about SIO is that it empowers us all to explore new frontiers right under our noses. You don't have to be a scientist, you just have to follow your curiosity. And every time you scan, you're helping to build the world's first database of matter that has tremendous implications for research, for medicine, for education, for our food system, and for our environment. You can also get our development kit and build applications of your own. Join the journey. Get your own SIO. Explore more. So Will was right. We, I, I walked into his office and I just had an idea. And uh, here we are six years later with um, this thing actually deployed on uh, my slides. Um, so as you can imagine with uh, this little uh, sensor, yeah, that one. Um, at some point, I found myself actually, uh, for about six months, totally obsessed with, yeah, with uh, basically cheese. And the reason I was obsessed with cheese is that we were going around with uh, this little sensor 
around the world, um, collecting cheese data from China to Europe to uh, the United States. I would, uh, you can ask Will, I would basically get off a plane, uh, go to the nearest supermarket, buy a piece of cheese, and then uh, start testing it and showing it off to partners, investors, um, potential customers, et cetera. And uh, I'm happy to report that, you know, at least in Berkeley, um, cheese is usually is advertised, even the local ones. Um, so uh, uh, really we're enabled by uh, three uh, key trends that uh, you are, I think, probably natives of. One is the smartphone, the second is uh, the cloud, and the third is the miniaturized optics. So miniaturized optics is something that um, people uh, have less of a tendency to think about, but all of your Instagram photos, all of uh, you know, the videos that go online are fueled by your smartphone cameras. And smartphone cameras, uh, now they're actually dual cameras in some of the latest phones. So when you think of 1.5 billion smartphones made a year, that means at least 3 billion cameras made a year. So there's an explosion in micro optics. We saw that when we started the uh, company. Uh, and that's kind of uh, the technology that enable us to uh, leverage that. Um, our background is in electrical engineering and um, I also have an MBA, so kind of me and my co-founder, my co-founder has a, a PhD in uh, uh, physics and optics. I come with a background of electrical engineering, also uh, business and investing. So together we could look at, at uh, kind of where this ecosystem is heading and start the company, which again was a piece of paper six uh, years ago. Um, so there are multiple um, industries where this uh, technology can be applied. I'm going to talk about food today. It's also a very natural application for the technology because near-infrared spectroscopy, which is what this thing is, it's a near-infrared spectrometer connected to the cloud, um, is actually something that is used in laboratories every day all around the food system. It's something that I'm sure exists at Impossible Foods in your labs. It's something that exists in um, labs that measure dairy, measure meat, measure um, oils, grains, everything that we eat at some point goes through a quality control system and it's measured by these near infrared spectrometers. It's not the only type of spectrometer, but these type of spectrometers exist today. Their bench top costs you anywhere between twenty to $100,000. Um, the uh, impetus of the original miniaturization of these spectrometers was that in, uh, after 9-11 in 2001, there was actually a very big anthrax scare in Congress. Uh, DARPA put a lot of money into miniaturizing these spectrometers. They came out in 05 and 06 with a handheld spectrometer that cost anywhere between eighty dollars to $100,000. So that was the next level of miniaturization. Obviously not consumer grade, not something that you can deploy massively and start gathering data. Um, so very similar to the computer um, revolution, Moore's Law, that uh, again, we are all uh, fortunate to enjoy. Uh, we imagine this thing will happen actually for uh, spectrometers. Uh, the smartphone camera, as I said, happened and exploded. This is what it looks like. So we, let's see if I have the, so we started the company around here when it just started to explode. And since then, the rest is history. You're all basically uh, snapping photos, sharing foods, um, you know, with the uh, smart content. So this is all. And, and by the way, when we started the company, the concept of somebody taking a camera, and I think even with you, Will, we had that conversation. Will, will people be um, scared and put on the spot for taking out a smartphone and taking a photo of food in a restaurant? So when we started the company, that was a big question. Will consumers ever adopt that? Thing? Right, so you're laughing. It's like not even, and I can tell you that one of my first slides in my investor pitch was, well, you know, there's a company that is thinking of doing this, but, you know, we think that will happen. And, and again, it's uh, just to think of how much has changed in the past five, six years is incredible. Um, uh, beyond the, uh, your smartphones, there is a, uh, billions of sensors that will be connected to the cloud over the next few years. Uh, our plan is for this sensor to be uh, one of the next ones. Um, the way it works, it all connects via Bluetooth to your smartphone, relays to the cloud. The entire scan time inside a smartphone is less than three seconds. And what I'm going to show you now is a, another video of something that we launched not even eight weeks ago. 
So let's, can, can we go back to the YouTube? Um, let me, where is it? Yeah, so, oh, good. so um, we've been working diligently since we started the company to miniaturize this even more. And eight weeks ago, we actually showcased this inside a phone. So you can imagine this being actually integrated inside your phone in the near future. Let's see if I can find it. Okay. Remember how exciting a new phone used to be? Sure, smartphones keep getting better, but better isn't good enough. We want a phone with the power to change the way we live. Introducing the Chang Hong H2, the only phone with a material sensor that can scan and analyze physical objects. The H2's material sensor absorbs light reflected back from an object, breaks it down into a spectrum, and analyzes it to determine its chemical makeup. Every object has a unique molecular fingerprint. The H2 is the only phone that can read it. It brings the power of laboratory science to the everyday, revealing a world of information never accessible before, from the sweetness of a fruit off the shelf to biometrics from your biceps. The H2 gives us the ability to discover more. Now your phone can verify a product's authenticity and warn you if something's not right. It's a brand new way to experience the world and all the sweetness it has to offer. Imagine a future where a phone can scan your skin or bring the real world into a virtual game. With a high density polymer battery, fingerprint sensor, six inch full HD display, all metal aircraft grade aluminum frame, 16 megapixel autofocus camera, and a SIO molecular sensor. The H2 gives us a reason to be excited again. The Chang Hong H2. Exciting is back. Okay, so this was, again, less, less than eight weeks old. Uh, this will be available in China in the middle of the year, end of the year in the United States. Um, so you can imagine where this eventually will be going. I'll just say one uh, final word about where this is applied uh, more upstream in the food supply chain. So we uh, started the, the company, launched the uh, product actually on Kickstarter. How many people know what Kickstarter is? Okay, so we launched it on Kickstarter. It was the uh, number 15 uh, most successful campaign ever, almost $3 million in pre-orders. And through that, we actually started a, uh, a movement of developers. We've shipped now over 3,000 developer kits. We have a movement of developers that has, A, uh, gave us a lot of ideas where this can be used, but uh, B, brought forth a lot of these, the way we learned about the industries that use near-infrared spectroscopy is actually through these um, very smart engineers and scientists that use it in the lab every day. They were super excited about us, and they basically called us up and said, well, we'd like to play with it. So we said, okay, you can play with it. And uh, then they called us back about a year later and said, well, we've played with it in the lab. There are ways for you to actually impact the food supply chain by pushing us from the lab out into the field. So uh, I think in the next probably two years, we're going to see massive adoption of this by basically the farming community first and then gradually down the supply chain. Thanks a lot, everybody. I don't know. Can you still buy that on Kickstarter? Online. GetSio.com. Scan your strawberries for sweetness. Um, our final guest speaker this evening is Kevin Brown. Kevin is also a technologist, a Haas grad, and um, decided in this chapter of his career to focus on one of his areas of passion, food. And uh, Kevin has co-founded a company called Init, which is looking to connect our kitchens and um, make them smart. So without further ado, Kevin Brown, are you ready? Yeah, let's go. Thank you. Thank you. 
So uh, always great to be here. I'm an undergrad Econ 90 from Berkeley and then uh, MBA 96. So uh, I was actually on the building committee for this building <laughs> when it was coming up. Uh, so uh, I'm really passionate about uh, what's happening at Haas in general, but specifically what's happening in food and the, the kind of uh, community that's starting to come together here, the faculty resources, I mean, what Will's been doing. Uh, you know, Mara O'Neill is here. She's one of the, the professors who uh, you know, I, I've, I've known for years and she's actually helping our company. So just the, 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 the relationships that you build uh, here uh, are gonna continue to, to span and now you know, 20 plus years, uh, you know, some of the people that we know, so I uh, really take it seriously. Uh, this is a pretty exciting time uh, in general uh, to be at Haas or to be you know, innovating in this area, but in particular for food, uh, this is a massive uh, wave of change that's coming and it's gonna be, uh, I think, really interesting to see how each of the, the trends that, that we're, we're looking at are all gonna add together into something and I'll, I'll draw a couple of uh, connections there. So think of everything in your life, and if you're, you know, been around a little bit longer, you know, you used to drive around with paper maps, and you know, it's like, uh, but every part of your life is now digitized. So music is digitized, movies, photography, you know, taxi cabs, you know, your car's about to drive itself. Uh, you know, I know the way to Berkeley. <laughs> you know, I've, I've lived in the Bay Area my whole life, but uh, when I drive here, I turn on Waze. Why? Because now I have you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of sensors and a supercomputer that's watching out for whatever's going on, and it shaved eight minutes off of my trip today. Because this is what's going to happen with everything. Everything is becoming digitized, and then you can apply algorithms and you know, sort of create new services and capability. But the world's biggest market, food, <laughs> is still pretty analog. It's really kind of been lagging behind. If you look at all the different segments, add them all up, it's about $21 trillion. So only about 0.14% of that market goes into information that actually makes it to consumers. So it's very underinvested. And you know, at each you know, step of the, the chain here, there's, just, there's a lot of inefficiency, uh, there's a lot of uh, challenges. And so if you look at you know, challenges around health, you look at challenges around food waste, economic impact, as we've heard here, they're, they're massive. And if you want to look for somewhere to make a difference in the world, this is one of the places where you can help people along many different axes. And also, I think there's a lot of great business to be done. So uh, I mentioned uh, food waste. So the average US family wastes about $1,500 a year in food for various reasons. Uh, if food waste was a country, it would be number three in greenhouse gas emissions. So think about that, right? These are really big problems, and it's because of you know, inefficiencies and lack of transparency and lack of tools to help at each stage there. And for the consumer, you imagine you, you go and you buy a bunch of things aspirationally, a bunch of great vegetables, and you bring them home, and you, you think you're going to use them, but then you get busy one night, and then you order in another night, and pretty soon you're walking over to the trash and dropping them in, and you just feel like crap because you feel like you kind of failed and you just wasted like $12 on you know, expensive organic produce, but you could have done something with that or if, if you'd really been tracking that or, or, or had some help with that, maybe you could have turned that into a delicious dinner and had a very different outcome. And sum that up across you know, billions of people and there's a, a huge opportunity that people can just deal with food in much smarter ways. So, you know, as you just saw, you know, from Sio, who's doing some tremendous work in next generation sensors, uh, you, you've got, you know, an opportunity where we're going to be able to listen to our food. So food has so much information. So I co-founded the, the company uh, with the former CEO of Nestle and Unilever in multiple parts of the world. So, uh, you know, just tremendous, brilliant visionary from the food industry. And he'd had hundreds of factories working for him. And so, you know, every coffee bean going into Nespresso, they know where it came from, they know its chemical makeup. You know, every carrot that goes into a P.F. Chang's frozen dinner is cooked to T minus three minutes. So that when it hits your pan three minutes later, it's perfect, as is every other ingredient. So there's so much precision when you're manufacturing food, when you're doing this, they have so much information and it's, it's tremendously impactful in terms of you know, you know, reducing waste, in terms of using uh, you know, things in the best way, in terms of getting a great outcome when you're cooking it. But what you know, happens with us with consumers, it's sort of like driving with a paper map. We kind of get lost all the time. There's no digital tools today to help us with how do you plan, shop, prepare, cook food. You're kind of on your own. 
And there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong at each of those stages. And as a result, uh, today, that friction, every other part of your life has gotten easier. But today, you know, sort of, you know, that whole food journey, you know, ending with you making a good meal, people are now eating out more than they're eating in with a tremendous economic impact, health impact, and many other sort of aspects to that. So what if we could listen to our food, take that information, connect it to your kitchen, to you, to your sensors, to your wearables, to all of that, and empower each of us, all of us, to, to really you know, have the same kind of convenience we have with all those other parts of our life, but with food. So let's talk a little bit about you know, you know, how industries are being transformed and disrupted. So think of, you know, sort of, you know, the, the social, you know, sort of photography piece I, I talked about, Facebook. They built what they call the social graph. These are the links between all the, the different friends, all the thumbs up, all of that data, a lot of complexity. And they use that to then figure out which cat video to show you right now on your newsfeed which one of your friend's birthday pictures is trending. So they're taking all of that complexity but summing it up into something simple, which is what, are, what do they use, you know, uh, you know what, what's those few little things they should show you to make your day a little bit more interesting. So likewise, Google has mapped all of the links on the web and has you know, essentially you know, uh, sort of put all that together. They look at all the searches. Did it look like you found what you wanted or you didn't? Uh, they have a tremendous amount of comp you know, complexity there. But they turn that into what are the top few pages they should show you out of the million that are out there. And so again, that's the food graph. Or, or sorry, the, the knowledge graph. Likewise, you know, whether it's Uber, you, know, you look at you know, how they're tracking all the geographic location of drivers and, and riders. These are all of the, the engines underneath that, that you can transform industries with. So what we're building is the food graph. So if you look at, you know, food is pretty complicated. So that we took a little snapshot of our back-end engine just to give you a sense, but you go from chicken to there's different parts of chicken to different states of it. Is it frozen? Is it refrigerated? Uh, to uh, is it packaged? Is it raw? Uh, you've got UPC codes for different products that you could have bought. You've got recipes. You've got uh, you know, nutrition. You've got allergies. Food is complicated. And that's been one of the, the challenges. You know, yes, well, why hasn't it been digitized? Because you have to get all of that and put it into an engine that can make sense of all of it so that you can go from, I've got this you know, piece of food in my fridge to what's for dinner, how do I combine that with different things and suggest what's for dinner, to helping me prepare it by pulling the right videos or the right content, to how do I send that to my smart oven with one click and make sure that, you know, because every chicken is different and every oven is different, so every recipe in the world is wrong. And if you've ever tried to cook a chicken, you probably figured that out, because sometimes you get chicken sushi, sometimes you get shoe leather, it's challenging to, to you know, and, and as a result, people become risk averse. And so, you know, if you look at this kind of data, if you can have all this data available and pipe that in and make your kitchen make all of the, the ways that you interact with food smarter with the food itself. What if you could connect the food to the kitchen? People are connecting things to things. You can connect your doorbell to your tea kettle. Okay, that's great. If you look at all the kitchen appliances coming out, like th this year, next year, they're all coming with Wi-Fi remote control. But the only thing you can do is kind of preheat from the couch. It's you know, not super useful. But if your chicken can talk to your oven, now you can start to have a real conversation and listen. And as you get more sensors that are being built in, like spectroscopy, for example, but there's gas sensors, there's cameras, there's temperature, there's weight, there's humidity, there's many variables. But as you listen to the food and take that, you can digitize that uh, and really use it to, to, to change how you know, that oven or that refrigerator or you know, that, that retail process works. So this is connected food. So uh, what if your food could tell you, hey, use me now, because <laughs> I, I know that you bought me about four days ago and it's time. Uh, and by the way, here's a recipe that you could use me. I, you, know, you bought the yogurt because you wanted it for breakfast. You haven't used it yet. Maybe it would make a great sauce because you've got tandoori spice, you've got some leftover chicken, got some squash. So all of a sudden now, a little bit of digital inspiration can take the resources you have and bring those together uh, and, and tie that into, for example, smart appliances. So you're going to see across the entire food ecosystem connected food, uh, you know, really whether it's, you know, the, you know, sort of the, the food talking to the package and telling you that, you know, you, you know, it's got another three days to live, 
whether it's the retailers, you know, just you heard a little bit about dynamic pricing, about, you know, sort of how do you, you know, efficiently, you know, sort of sell and manage that food, uh, whether it's your, your kitchen appliances. So one of the things that uh, we had to do was we had to, to, to really prototype and build some of this stuff to actually bring it to life. And so we wanted to, to solve some key consumer questions like, what's for dinner? What's in my fridge? How do I prepare it? How do I cook it? So uh, what we've done is we've built essentially an operating system for food. And so we've now started to roll that out to power smart appliances in the smart kitchen. So uh, we're starting to work with manufacturers that are making smart ovens, for example. Uh, if you look at the refrigerator manufacturers, they're putting cameras in. So we've done computer vision to be able to start to identify foods just by seeing it. Uh, we're tying in, we uh, acquired a company last week called Shopwell that uh, has uh, been downloaded over two million times and they tie into your retail experience. They help you compare foods with personalized nutrition. So now we can take what you bought at the grocery store, take that information, load that in, and now when you get home, or even when you're you know, loading your bags into the back of your car, your grocery basket can essentially be telling you what's for dinner and then helping you step by step through how to do that. And then ultimately you push the button and send a 15 step Michelin star recipe to your oven, right? So the idea is how do you make all that simple so every day you can you know, uh, cook more easily, you can be more successful in the kitchen. And uh, you know, this is I think emblematic of every industry. Look at the automobile industry. They're figuring out how do we digitize cars and make them drive themselves. You look at you know, sort of uh, you know, folks that are, for example, in like uh, manufacturing. You know, uh, the Internet of Things trends are changing every single one of these industries. So for everyone here, as an opportunity, understanding how those systems work, understanding the way that these changes are happening, there's a lot of analogies that if you take the industry that you're interested in, and for all of you, it looks like it's food. The good news is that there's a lot of changes happening here that create opportunity. <laughs> So that's a little bit about uh, what we're doing. Uh, there was one uh, sort of topic that Will brought up, which is barriers to entry. And this is a really important one as an entrepreneur because you can do something great, but if you don't do it in a way that you protect it and, you know, and everyone else is kind of coming in and copying it, that's kind of the worst thing. You come up with this great idea and you, you can't really turn it into something. And then you can't get invest investment against it and you can't do it. So think about what are the different ways, whether, you know, sometimes you get a patent, sometimes you get a technology that, you know, is too hard for someone else to catch up to. Sometimes it's a team. Sometimes it's a brand. Sometimes it's partnerships and contracts that you've locked up. So th this is one of the things to think about. And if you're at the business school, you'll, you'll have a you know, chance to, to really sort of dig into this from a theory perspective. But the idea here is that there, there's a lot of ways that as you're building these companies, think about what you're doing that's really unique. You should be outsourcing and, and you know, sort of taking things that aren't unique and you know, sort of having someone else help with those. But think about the things that you really can do that are, are unique and then protect them. Thank you. Excellent. Let's do this um, just in the interest of time. Who's got a question? Who's got a tough question? Or who heard something that wasn't exactly or needs further clarification? Can you stand up? And here, take this mic because this puts it on the camera and direct it to one of our guests or more. All right, hi everyone, thank you for coming. Um, so I work in the CPG industry and I know half of you have MBAs and half of you don't. Um, for those who have your MBAs, how do you think they've helped you with your food startups? And for those who don't, do you feel like it's necessary at this point in time? Great question. Why don't Megan, you start? You've got the newest MBA. One. Yeah, so I graduated from the evening weekend program in May, last May, I, I suppose. You know, I think, I went into business school at Haas with the intention of starting a company and leveraging all the resources that are available to us at Haas in doing so. Um, I think the, the top three ways that it helped, first, the network of great students that you're surrounded with, um, many of which went on to found their own companies. Um, second, being able to leverage courses to actually work on your company. So, there's a gazillion projects that you'll work on in your MBA. Um, having a real life company to actually use in those projects is incredibly invaluable. And then um, I think the third is, is you've got the broader network of Haas and Berkeley, which when you're looking to acquire your first customers, that's always a, a warm, you know, sure, I'll give it a try. And, and that certainly opened a lot of doors for, for us 
and you get fantastic professors like Will, who has, you know, been through the journey of being an entrepreneur and starting a, a company in the food system. So, one uh, thing Ma that Megan didn't mention. Um, one thing that she didn't mention that's particularly impressive is when she she started out in one business and then pivoted actually into another business, ended up. Um, acquiring her competitor and then I think in the course of all that you had two children too <laughs> so <Yes>. <laughs> she had two children and a company in the course of four or five years so pretty pretty amazing accomplishment so, <laughs> and, and the youngest is is two months old so when I invited her here I didn't even know whether <laughs> she'd be able to get out of the house, but you're happy you did tonight. Right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is Ooh. relaxing. <laughs> BJ, what, what would you add to, uh, to, yeah, I think, to that? I think the top of Megan's answer with the network is, is super, super important. And, and sometimes you you like, you like go into business school knowing that's going to be true and you think about it, but it's not until you know maybe you know after you graduate, a couple years after you graduate, you think back and you think, wow, the, the network <laughs> piece of advice is actually important. And you know, even just in my evening weekend class, um, Andrew Chow, who started Boba Guys, the Boba Tea Shop, was there. And he was thinking about something totally different when he started the MBA program. And it's been a journey for him to think through that idea and see it through. So getting to know other people on the same journey as you, um, you know, being able to like you know share kind of not just advice, but also just like the emotional like highs and lows of going through those experiences is really important. And I think a lot of people, there are a lot of entrepreneurs that they don't have MBAs and they also find great networks, but I think there's something about the, the people you meet during your program that you get to know when they're at different stages of that journey that really um, you're able to have that, that emotional connection with them or those sort of experiences. Anybody wanna add? Kevin, Drawer, Rebecca, Nick? I would just say that I think role models is something very important in everybody's journey. And my experience in my MBA gave me some role models that I could uh, relate to. And, and that's something that, you know, you can always get, I think, as you go through life, the MBA just accelerates some of it and gives you, um, I think, abilities to access different role models. So, you know, uh, you know, Will is an example, but there are multiple uh, ones. And I think, at least for me, that reduced the fear of entrepreneurship now it's I guess you know very sexy and you know it's everybody it's you got blogs and everything is really nice but you know when when I went to a business school there were no blog it wasn't kind of that part and at least for me that seeing people um, walk the path I think is uh, reduces the uh, fear factor tremendously. Great. Who else has got a question? Here, can I have your mic? Uma, go up to Uma here. All right, this question's for Nick. Uh, so as somebody who formerly managed a restaurant, I understand how much efficiency there is when you remove cash. Uh, but how do you reconcile that with uh, providing affordable and healthy food for people who don't have bank accounts or credit cards and rely on cash to eat on a daily basis? Uh, and I think there's a stat of one in three Berkeley students are food insecure, if I remember correctly from Food Venture Lab. So it is a relevant topic on this campus. Yeah, so th that's a great question. And I think, you know, a change is that big for us was something that we spent about a year or a year and a half testing in so many different cities and different kinds of restaurants with different demographics. And for us, that was the last major concern that we spent a lot of time um, trying to think about of uh, how we can make sure to optimize for that and, and serve every customer. Um, and for us, as we think about how the model is going to continue to evolve to serve every customer, um, you know, cash was a... Uh, I mean, just to give you an example, the reasons why we took out cash were also, it wasn't just optimization and you know, making the model more efficient, like things like safety. You know, when there's no cash in the restaurant, our employees can't get robbed, which happens quite a bit at gunpoint sometimes. Um, it is the dirtiest thing in the restaurant. Uh, and so there is a lot, of, it, there's a lot of other reasons, but as we thought about the you know, unbanked community, um, it's something that we're very conscious about. And one of the things that we have um, in Q to test is these machines that you can install in your restaurants that you can put cash in and get a gift card out. So the reality is today, in the, where our existing restaurants are, through a year of testing, it wasn't a problem and we got almost no complaints. Some people were just kind of like against the idea, but you know, it didn't stop their transaction. But so we have this solution in place when we do start to really expand our footprint and go to different communities. Thanks. Rebecca, you had mentioned something about, I think you said something about genetically modified 
organisms in your product. How is that going to play out? So it's not a genetically modified product that's in our burger. What we do is we have a genetically modified yeast strain that produces a protein, which is then isolated and incorporated into the burger. That's our plant blood heme. Um, so that's a simple answer. I, I, I'm just imagining Alice, you know, kind of turning around here. Right, right and, and so I think what I kind of come back to is, you know, our story is not the same story as Alice Waters, um, but there, there has to be space for both of those narratives within a food secure future. Um, we're a scalable system, we're efficient, we're not necessarily local right now, we're not organic, uh, but finding ways for people to reduce their food footprint and to, to eat lower on that food chain, especially when it comes to meat and dairy, that's, that's where we fit in. And, and in terms of the um, public communication, does having a genetically modified process, will that manifest as a label? You know, imagine when I'm buying this in the supermarket, will that need to be labeled or will that be something that the FDA is going to keep? It depends. So we've been following that really closely. Um, it depends on what level of yeast remains in the product. There is a little bit of yeast extract that stays there. If it's under a certain percent, I don't know that it needs to be labeled, but I would defer that to the marketing team. But in terms of perception, I think, um, you know, we're pretty agnostic about GE as a technology. Um, and and I, I just don't know that it has really been too much of an issue for our consumers, but I think our, our marketing folks would, would know better. Yeah. Thank you. Who else has got a question? I'm going to go over here. Sorry. Stand up, please. Yeah. Also a question for Nick. Wow. Um, what If McDonald's and Burger King called your company tomorrow, what would you all say to them? And Oh, sorry, not Nick. Um, what's Rebecca. her name? Rebecca. Sorry, Rebecca. <laughs> sorry, Rebecca. Sorry. Easy to get them confused, yes. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm here kind of on behalf of our CEO and, and our leadership, so um, I'm going to defer that uh, as, as well. Um, you punt that one? Yeah. <laughs> I think they would probably say sell the product, right, as much as possible. Or there, There's scale considerations there. Uh, of course. We understand that. <laughs> we know it's only sold right now in a couple of places. Yep. Um, yeah, but you take the PO. You take the PO, yeah. Right. Okay, right here. Um, this is to all of you. If you could start a new business or startup today in food tech that's different than what you're currently working on, what would it be? <laughs> okay, you each have 12 seconds to answer that question. That's a hard question. I mean, they're all pathologically optimistic about what they're doing right now. Uh, They're committed. I mean, I, I mean, I would say there's a lot of exciting things going on, like the microbiome and personalized nutrition. And for me, that's a space I'd probably spend a lot of time in. I think there's a lot of room. I mean, we've had to recreate this uh, kind of fresh grab-and-go supply chain. Because when you walk the aisles of a Whole Foods or a Safeway or whatnot, there really isn't that, that much variety. So I have no desire to run a kitchen again, but at the same time, there is a, an acute need that I see for a broader selection of ready-to-eat, grab-and-go, healthy options with clean ingredients. So, so as you start to you know, follow these trends, more sensors, more connected things, uh, you know, sort of more data that's available, what, one of the, 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 the big questions is what do you do with all of that? And so the, the, the answer to that in many cases going forward is uh, things like machine learning. So I would look at you know, where can you build sort of uh, systems that are looking at specific problems or parts of that equation and uh, really bring the experts in that know what the problems are but solve them in a new way. And the, the potential returns on some of that could be quite large. Excellent. Okay, who wants to have the last question tonight? Okay, right here. One consequence from so much data on food could be removing it from the humanized, human aspect of it all and uh, with such regulated and uh, uniform food, how are you going to avoid losing the social aspect? Is that directed to Kevin? Okay. 
I'll start with that one. There may be others. So I, I, it's a great question because you know. The question, so sorry. the question was uh, with all of this data and so forth. The, how do we you know sort of not lose the human aspect of this? And there's so much joy and social benefit to food. And so I I think of food as as connective. You know, so it's a network between people. It's a way to you know to to share love or to 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 welcome you know folks into the home. The preparation of it and just being part of that. All of that really matters to us. And so uh, our goal is not to fire mom and dad out of the kitchen. <laughs> it's to help them. To, it's actually to bring them back. Because today there's so many things that are harder that go wrong. When you buy that $30 piece of salmon and put it in the oven and get distracted for two minutes and you come back and you've just murdered it, <laughs> that's a really tough, you know, that's a tough experience. But it's tough on a Tuesday night when yeah, now you have a dinner disaster and the kids are hungry and the spouse is grumpy. And like, you know, the, the, you know people need a little bit of help. But uh, there's, there's plenty of room for people to, to you know, do the seasonings and to chop it. And we want to show them, actually up-level their skills. And you know, sort of just like Waze, today, you know, you're still driving your car. We're just helping you go new you know, ways. If, you know, uh, you know, so think of that for food. Uh, and I think there's always going to be room for that artistic and, and human component of it. I'll tell you one quick story. Uh, Duncan Hines cake mix, I don't know if you've ever, ever heard of that, is you should just be powder. And what they did is they added an egg to the mix, and the sales went through the roof. Because instead of just mixing something up, you were actually baking. You were making, so there was fresh food. It, it, it just, it changed the whole experience for people and the pride that they had in bringing that to their families. I just baked you a cake. So th there's a lot of that psychological aspect that's, I think, important in this case particularly and for business in general. Anybody else want to add to that? Well, let's have a big hand for our uh, guests tonight. <laughs> One last question for you iClicker owners, just before the bell here. This is courtesy of Rebecca's talk. The global footprint of animal agriculture, livestock, and livestock products as a percent of the ice-free surface of the planet is A, less than 10%, B, about 25%, or greater than 30%. Remember? Oh, and we also have a um, a fifteen dollar sweet green gift from Nick, so you can. Uh, we have people at the doors, so when you go out, thank you, Nick and Sweet Green. That's better than a T-shirt being thrown up into the audience. All right, let's. And next week, Raj Patel and Michael Pollan at Edible Education 101.